This episode of Skirmish Supremacy is brought to you by Reformation Brewery, the official beer of your game night. would have been even more priceless if that was actually the uh, <laughs> I know what we had yeah. recorded <laughs> <laughs> and now we're on an FBI watch list but anyway. <laughs> I, I would have found out if uh, anyone so, was actually listening yeah exactly all right folks welcome back to episode 129 of skirmish supremacy uh Nick and I are joined tonight by Sean Stutter of Relic Blade oh uh, Metal King Studios and uh his game Relic Blade which we all know we all love and if you don't Listen up, get to know it, and go buy some shit, goddammit. But uh that's sorry. some harsh language, my goodness. Right <laughs> off the bat. I'm I'm getting <laughs> going right for you. Uh, uh, well, I mean, just just hold on. Do you, you need to pull up the chat because I mean Wait, no, don't maybe don't pull up the chat. Okay, okay. I, to, I probably sent those prematurely. Okay. I I, I did I was I was wondering. <laughs> I was like, I should send these to these guys and then uh, wait, I could wait and get their live reaction. I, well, no, this is literally our live reaction. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's. do you want us to tell everyone else about it? Yeah, so, all right, um, I can jump in. I'm So, uh, I, I'm Sean Sutter. As they said, I'm the creator of the <laughs> Um And I... I finally announced the that I've got a upcoming Kickstarter. Big surprise. I've run uh, like November <laughs> uh, fall Kickstarter every year for the past three years and uh, to support the same game Relic Blade and release new content. And so I've got two new factions coming out and a, and a book. And I just sent some renders, of some new sculpts I'm working on over to the chat so to get like the live reaction. What do you guys think that that elf archer is what I've been sculpting today? So she's not even finished, but I wanted to share it because it's actually looking kind of cool. All right. So this is an elf archer, which um, looks, looks glorious. She is like diving or leaping forward off of a tree limb, I believe, or is it supposed to be a cool flame effect? It's so she has a special ability called Shadow Strider. Okay. And so it's like magic. All right. So it's it's like the Shadow Fox. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Like so, the Shadow Fox. So, you know, it's it's a cloud effect. Yeah. So she's, cool. you know, like diving out of it or something, has the bow outstretched, you know, like she just loosed an arrow. Um she is she's amazing. She's got leaves in her hair. Yeah, it's fun. I like I'm I always really like the wood elves and um and so it's fun for me to be able to sort of just bring bring my favorite parts of fantasy to life in Relic Blade and so I'm really excited to make an elf archer way watcher type character. I I really like it. I I like I like her. She um she is definitely uh nice will go in nicely with all of the other elf characters that, mm-hmm. that are in the game. Yeah, and she has kind of a cool play style because she, um, she can teleport. She has Mountaineer also, so she always passes climb checks. Oh, but man. She doesn't have any close combat options. So she's armor one, can sort of teleport around and make a bunch of ranged attacks, but she's super squishy and ready to get killed if she gets caught. <laughs> but it'll be hard to catch her because she can just shift into the shadows and disappear. Right, which which is totally awesome. Um, now now that makes me think that she really needs the Shadow Fox companion. Oh yeah, that would be fun. But, but I've already told you that the uh, the um, that the Shadow Fox needs to just be a companion option, anyways. Yeah. Um and uh for Tim who can't actually see these right I now. I can't see what? a damn thing. They're they're in if you open the Google Hangout, you know, like the Google chat application, they're in there, Tim. Um oh, making me do stuff. 
Who, maybe I, I bet I could just do screen share, huh? The- uh, you could, you could do screen share, but I totally love being able to stare at these <laughs> and uh, drool and not let Tim see them. Yeah, because I can't see anything. So this elf sounds cool. Oh, good. You can <laughs> what the listeners would be thinking. Yeah, exactly. I'm, right. I'm getting the listener experience on my own show. Uh, but uh... <laughs> so, so here's here's the next one. I'll, I'm going to save the elf for myself. Oh, here, okay. here, Tim, check it out. <laughs> Screen share. Uh, is... You're too nice. So, uh, sweet. Archer. Oh yeah, I love that one. <laughs> and I've been I've got like lost trying to sculpt her hair for. I, you know what? I, I totally missed it. The hair is flowing back, you know, going along with that whole she's diving out of the shadows anyways. Um, you know, so diving out, hair flowing crazy back. It's actually crazy long. She probably actually hates it because <laughs> any woman I know that has that much hair is like, I hate my hair. My hair was about half that length at one point, believe it or not. And I oh, hated it. It's awesome. <laughs> So I've only known Tim with, you know, maybe a finger's worth of hair or none. So <laughs> thinking of Tim with a mullet is, uh, is terrifying. I no, it wasn't, no, it wasn't cool a mullet. Metal hair. It was a mullet. Yeah. You lived in Clearwater, Florida. It was a mullet. Oh, no, it was gone before I even moved to Clearwater. Thank God. Um, no, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I used to have like the straight metal head, like long hair. Nice. And of course, like I was into the whole goth scene. So, of course, it looked like long, stringy and greasy. Which, uh, you know, of course, always, you know, helps with the ladies. But anyway, uh, so, yeah, the elf looks amazing. I actually like this pose a lot. Uh, for those of you listening, um, yeah, too bad. Uh, so, <laughs> but, yes, the the elf, this is, like, a straight-up action pose. Like, it, it reminds me a lot of, like, an anime pose in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's, and, it's and, not totally over the top, but it's a little bit like um, Matrix jumping through the air bullet time. I don't know. I'm I'm excited about it. Yeah, yeah. it's your it's your it's your high it's your high fantasy mid action pose. Yeah, no, I mean you know it's it's definitely you know I am running shooting this bow and just being a badass. I I totally love the feel of it. Now, obviously, she's going to be a new hero character. I take it that's not a villain. Yeah, so she's going to be in uh, a faction set with this oh. guy. That um, guy is amazing. So this is an Arboleth Sentinel. He's a, a tree man, and he's about the size of the Stonekin. So he'll be on a 40 mil base. And Love this uh, model. A real serious brawler. So, so think... Think tree be- tree beard, but badass. Yeah, <laughs> tree beard yeah, with like, the face of Macho Man Randy Savage. Great there you go. Meets Hulk meets tree beard. Yes, <laughs> Hulk meets tree beard. Uh, yeah, so this guy. So I'm I'm putting the Pathfinder, the Archer, along with this Sentinel, and then the Druid and Bear. So that will that will get the Druid and Bear up to date with color cards and um, a nice nature. Uh, Wilderkin Part Two set. Uh, it'll, I think they'll be the Lostwood, Lostwood Enclave or something like that. Um, so it's like a different flavored, uh, more forest themed rather than like stone themed Wilderkin. And then, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this guy. He's got some cool skills. Uh, in fact, he's got the um, uh, brawler tactic. Right? Is that what it's called? The one that you came up with, Nick. Um, wait the the brawler one that I came right, up with. It, uh, I I I'll call it I called it brawler, but it's one where you can make a free, a free oh. attack with improvised attack. Right. So if you miss your first attack, you get to you know do a, a free free you know yeah improvised attack. Yeah, exactly. So he he's going to be the. Um, the, the one to feature the tactic that you came up with at Adepticon. Awesome. Yeah. So he's a giant fun. tree. It's, Anything it's it swings is a weapon. <laughs> it's unrestricted, so anyone can take that tactic, but the art has an arbalist smashing a man at arms. Cool. Because because I really thought of it for um for the knight because he, you know, like swings his sword and if he misses, you know, it just went through my head. Swing the sword, miss 
and you know you just you like knee your opponent or something like or not even miss like they block it and you just you knee him or you hit him with your elbow or something yeah exactly you know just just something that it's like ah i still got you because i've spent all this time learning how to fight um and and on him i think that that would be really awesome yeah you block this fist but here's this one coming down on top of you yeah because... so he's, he's going to come in and and mess guys up and he's also he's a little bit more on the tanky side um but i think he'll play a really fun role so i really like the mushrooms on the shoulder mm-hmm um, you know, there's a bunch of uh, mushrooms growing off his shoulder. He's got like massive forearms that are all just tree bark, um, big tree hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, those big awesome. forearms just feed into great big hands. Um, so you know, this guy means means you know serious business, and his yeah, beard and hair are leaves. Yeah, yeah, he's got a sweet. Tree mustache. <laughs> see, for some yes. reason, every time I see this model, I just picture it smashing another model and it's going, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he definitely has like a kind of a wrestler look there. The he, pose may be oh, part of it. Oh, he he very much does. You know, he is kind of kind of hunched. You know, his legs are spread out like he's he is going to grapple with somebody. I just can't think of anyone who really wants to get in close enough to grapple with him. I'm just trying to think of a good macho man randy savage slash tree pun and i just can't i've got nothing but i'm sure it's there (laughs) well now now i've got it now i gotta do some thinking um and then we could just have a maneuver he is a tree just call it snap into it and he just like runs in there (laughs) um so and you guys, did you guys see these? I don't know. So then the the other faction, so there'll be two factions, so that's part of the Kickstarter. One's going to be like tree elf guys. Um, and then the other one is going to be dwarves. And these will be the first neutral faction for Relic Blade, which I think is going to be really cool because it gives players, <laughs> especially <laughs> new players. <laughs> what am I looking at? This is amazing. <laughs> It, it's Harry Potter, but as a dwarf. <laughs> yeah, so they're they're going to be a neutral faction that uh, can like I'll choose or work for either alignment, uh, and so that'll be kind of fun because that way players will be able to um, add a wizard to their warband, and everyone gets to access it. And then uh, also for new players that are just picking up Relic Blade for the first time in this Kickstarter would be able to get this dwarf faction and then from there expand into just absolutely anything. So, right. And that, yeah. that is awesome. And I am really glad you're finally introducing, uh, you know, some neutrals. Um, yes. Be- because, you know, being able to, uh, you know, have them on the good or bad side, depending on what you feel like playing is, is great. Um, this guy is really awesome. He just made it more awesome by giving him a really cool magic effect. All right, so that's this is the like uh, sort of primitive sub tool for the spell. So I want you to get an idea. So he's an illusionist, <laughs> and then he's going to be able to cast an illusion. And this is the illusory horror miniature. So it's going to be a model that uh, that procs onto the table and has AOE effects um, that will. Uh, lend to him his role as a control caster. That is awesome. Yeah, I dig it. So, so what we're looking at, folks, is a big blob. It looks almost so. Keep in mind, we're looking at a Z brush, right? So it's all black and white, but it looks like almost like a a a a water effect in a way, just because of, of the shape of it, with like teeth, eyes, and like some hands off to the side, and like a hoof. I mean, yeah, it's, so it's like it's, it's like a gigantic mouth yeah yeah yeah. so so it's a cloud that has a bunch of eyes and some really really big teeth like these teeth so the dwarf the dwarf was you know dwarf size these teeth are about dwarf size (laughs) okay they're really seeing them side by side it's about half the dwarf height so there's some really big teeth that would mean that it is definitely gnome size or bigger yeah yeah so it's like a a big old it'll be a 40 mil uh, model. Nice. And so that'll be a lot of fun. And this set is also going to 
Um, one thing that I noticed with the last Kickstarter is I designed two factions that were um, increased complexity to, for the player. And, uh, and I, and I had a lot of fun. I really like playing those factions, but they do have like a higher skill cap to play well. So that's uh, speaking specifically the Iguan, uh, mm-hmm. Wretched Hive set. Like they're a great unit. Like they work together really well. They've got good synergy, but you really have to be on top of knowing your rules to get the most out of them. Um, whereas the earlier sets are, are more straightforward. The battle pigs, like you can just charge into battle. Uh, the yeah, Temple of Justice, like they're yeah, they're pretty hardy. Like they've got heals and high armor, and like it's hard to go wrong. So one thing I wanted to do with this set is kind of revisit the game as as a um, quintessential questing party. So we've got we're going to have a fighter, a wizard, and a rogue. Oh, and, nice! And you sent us the rogue just a few minutes ago as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and so they, that's going to really give players a, a wonderful questing party that you can add any model to, like any good guy or bad guy to that questing party, and then it'll be totally playable um, as a 100-point list. But as it is, the three characters obviously are playable for getting through most of the campaign. But um, And then also their play styles, they add new elements that are going to be fun and engaging without adding a higher skill cap to play. So I think that this is going to be a really good set for people to get introduced to the game and, uh, and really enjoy the, what Relic Blade is about, which is uh, capturing the excitement of being in control of a whole D&D party and mm-hmm. sending them on dangerous quests for awesome treasure and control of a dying world. So uh, it's, I think it's going to be really great. Uh, I'm sure of it, in fact. This so this dwarf rogue, I really dig this model. Like everything about this, just yeah. It, it, I, that's all I could say. I, I'm, I'm looking at this and like it's. I, I love the pose. The fact that like it's it's a dwarf that's actually looking agile for a change outside of like oh I'm jumping off a rock with an axe. Um. So he's so again for folks listening at home, it's very much like he's well he's barefoot and he's kind of got like a little bit of a a jumping effect behind him, but he's got two daggers, which is something you almost never see with dwarves. It's either like crossbow or axes, you know, or something that kind of screams Lord of the Rings dwarf where this is not that at all. Like it, it, it looks like your typical D and D rogue where you kind of picture the daggers and like the hand wraps, but it just happens to be this stocky little bearded bastard that just won't leave you alone. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> yeah. Um, kind of like a, a dirty, yeah, he's a real, real dirty cutthroat. Well, yes. and it, it looks like you gave him some, uh, some like fire pots, or I, I can't think of what it is, but you can throw it, and it'll cause smoke and allow you to run away. Yeah, yeah, he's got the smoke bomb potion on his. On yeah, his and then also an extra potion. dagger hanging on the back. Since... Extra dagger, so you know, I, I'm, that. I'm, I'm hoping one of his rules is he can throw his daggers. Mm, yeah, he can. But all all rogues can. All the daggers can be thrown. Well, true, I guess. Yeah. But he all, his cool ability is um, what is it called? I think the the working title for his rule is <laughs> oh, razor sharp is the working title. But it makes it so that when you put a dodge token on him, he can roll an extra die for damage and then discard the lowest. So. When oh, wow. when you play him right, he's a super high DPS rogue. Like uh, that'll be his main role is actual tank DPS and then control in this party. W- the wizard is control. The fighter will be a tank, and then this guy's going to be your real like damage dealer. So it's a lot of fun. Um, nice. And the rule plays clean and is is a uh, super satisfying to be able to discard your ones and deal tons of damage with those daggers. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> because I hate ones. Yeah, and I too. roll them way too often. Me too. <laughs> That's the thing about rolling a D6 is like... Well, it's the thing about rolling dice. If you roll bad, you really just kind of... <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, definitely true. Um, and, I, you know, I, I love... I just... I love how you're... I mean, I love 
pretty much all of your characters or all of them. I don't think there's one I don't like. That's so um, you know, but uh, but I love how your dwarves are just just so dwarfish. They're they're not even like your you know typical dwarves. Like their bodies are just small, but then they've got these massive arms and legs, you know, and and yet they don't look like freakishly odd either. Yeah, you know what I think it might be because I haven't really analyzed the analyzed it much, but I think that these dwarves are probably more influenced by World of Warcraft dwarves, maybe? Maybe. Maybe a little bit, because his face does remind me a little bit of uh, of a Warcraft dwarf. Yeah. Um, I don't know so much about the body composition or anything yeah, like that. Right. But, but the face a little bit, but, uh, you know... That's because you tend to have, you know, that cartoon slash comic style with what you do. So, yeah. and so do they. So, you know, it's it's a little yeah. hard to avoid or, you know, not draw some similarities to it. These dwarves are um, based, because the first real dwarf I sculpted for Relic Blade was the um, a Hellhound Berserker that I, I did as a collaboration with Dark Wizard Berserker. Right, uh, and and so he actually designed the first dwarf to like officially appear in Relic Blade, and so that sort of set the tone for how dwarves would look. I think where the direction I was going with them initially was that they'd be like more gangly, but I think I have a tendency to draw and, and design characters that are gangly because I'm pretty gangly. And, uh, <laughs> But I, I think I'm really happy with these guys. They've got like giant forearms and like they're really rugged and funky. Mm-hmm. And these guys in particular are, are the Moldorbs and they come from a subterranean world that had no connection to the surface. Like the surface only sort of existed in, in myth to them. And so when they come to the surface, it's, they're discovering like the outer space. Like they're, they're discovering mm-hmm. a world that, didn't exist to them previously, which is how uh, it fits in that they don't already have a path alignment. Uh, right. As, as, as far as being an f- advocate or adversary in the world of Relic Blade. And so they come to the surface and suddenly are exposed to all of these, like the powers that are struggling on the surface, which of course are the players choosing their alignment and then controlling heroes and villains according to their own will. So. That's nice. part of it, is that these dwarves come to the surface and they're like, oh, there's something happening up here, and then players <laughs> jump on and, and influence them from there. There's a fight going on. Yeah, I exactly. came right at the right time, guys. Also, the sun is so bright. <laughs> yeah. Actually, so that makes me think of I, I don't remember which which one it was of the um oh uh, dragon whatever game it was. Oh wow! I just totally, totally flubbed it. They mm-hmm. they made like three of them, anyways. Uh, Bio, Bioware game. Dragon oh, Age. Dragon Age. Dragon Age. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I think it's the first one. You you pick up that dwarf and and he actually you know comes out on the surface with you, and he's like, oh man, <laughs> he's like, how do you get you know? And, and for like the first half, he's like. How do you guys deal with this great big shiny thing? <laughs> That's hilarious. I didn't. I didn't know that was. I mean, it's inevitable. But uh, well, you know, every, every fantasy trope I'm riffing off of, but I love it. Yeah, they've all got like giant hats and and glasses to try and deal with the extreme brightness of the sun. Yeah. And we're back to dwarf Harry Potter, yes. who has these great big glasses. So you know that that's kind of where the you know Harry Potter comes from. Big old that, sun hat. Yeah, he's got a great big sun hat. He's got books everywhere, potion bottles, um, yeah, just jar. all yeah, a little jar. I, I think that looks like one of those old school little lunch pails. So I'm, I'm gonna go with the lunch pail idea. Yeah, um, you know, kind of kind of a lot like you know, Billman Bill. Oh yeah, but this guy packs around books. He's got lots and lots of books. Right, right, lots of books. He's he's got to be able to study. You never know when you're in the middle of a fight and reading a book will actually be the solution to uh, whatever your problem is. Yeah, exactly. It's very wizard-like. And so, like, the wizards have been something that Relic Blades needed for a long time. 
Um, but I haven't added them really specifically yet because I wanted to do them right. And I wanted them to be something more than just uh, magic archers. Cause like I'm, I'm trying to recreate the feel of playing Dungeons and Dragons, not the feel of playing Gauntlet where every character is just <laughs> like a skin over um, an attack. And so I wanted to really, really take some time to design them. And I, I never really played wizards that much. So I talked to a lot of my friends that are longtime D and D veterans and, like what what explain to me like what's the best thing about being a wizard and they're like oh let me tell you so uh, this is gonna be like the first he's he's a control caster an illusionist and so he doesn't really deal damage but he's a really big denial piece yeah for, for play and so that's fun it's neat i i, I play tested it myself but then i brought it to um, a play test group and and because you can't really play test control with yourself and be like, well, no. what would I do? And then like, oh, well, what would I do to foil all my plans? Like you can't really get in that mindset <laughs> as easily as like, what's the optimum move for actually crushing someone well, like this? And what's the optimum move for not getting crushed? So you can kind of play test by yourself. But um, the first game they played, they set up the wizard. And I was like, so how did it feel? And it's like, it felt awesome and i turned to his opponent how did it feel he's like oh it felt awful it's like i was <laughs> playing against a blue deck in magic i was like yes <laughs> all right <laughs> perfect and i was like all right well what did you learn and then they played again and it was way more intense because he knew he was going to get controlled so he was all over you know trying to outsmart the wizard so i think it's it's shaping up pretty sweet nice. that, that sounds that sounds really good um you know, I uh, I definitely look forward to uh, you know throwing some wizards out there, especially with that Iguan witch. Mm-hmm. She's a witch. So the one thing I've been very impressed about so far with your dwarves, I think above everything else, is that they have knees. Mm, they do. <laughs> they yes. Probably my biggest pet peeve when I see a lot of people do dwarves. It's like they always just like make them where they they're just like these little bricks with feet. You know, at least with yours, they look like they're moving. You know, the wizard, yeah, we get it. Like, he's got the wand and all that. And I'm not, like, dismissing the wizard. But, like, you could really tell with the rogue. Because, again, he's doing, like, an agile leaping, which is something that you just never see with dwarves. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun. I think um, one thing that I have to do as an artist is, like, really understand the the anatomy and how it works and everything. And so it like really bugs me if there's armor that you couldn't, you couldn't lift your arms in. Yeah. Like, like it, for example, if you were a space Marine <laughs> and, <laughs> and every model you were trying to pose, it was always like a struggle against the design. And so yeah. I like with all of these, I'm trying to make sure that they've got um, some believability. And I think, yeah, I agree. I mean, I played, a dwarf rogue in world of Warcraft at one point. And, uh, and I thought it was such a fun thing because, because the dwarves in the Hobbit are all roguish types for the most part. I mean, they hire a burglar and they're going on a treasure hunt. Um, And so I don't know. I thought it was kind of fun to try and do something that wasn't your average, like Warhammer stunty with a big ax and, and, but try and get get more at an uh, underappreciated, like dangerous edge of the dwarves. I, I like yeah. it. Now, um, I did want to jump back to the uh, the tree dude for sure. a second. Um, we don't really have to flip over to him, but. Uh, I'm I'm trying to think. In in the last Kickstarter, you did the um, the legends. Yes, it, he's inspired by one of them, isn't he? Yep. Yeah. Um, in the Legends three card pack, two different guys um, had me design Tree Folk, and uh, and it was neat because I've all, I've really liked Tree Folk. Uh, since I first read the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> right. Right. And, and then, you know, with Warcraft three, the night elves had like really cool tree men. And, um, 
And I've I've always really liked them. And so when they asked me to design them, and, and for, for background, the Legends sets are uh, Kickstarter backers can pledge at a certain level, and then they tell me about a Dungeons & Dragons character or an imaginary character that they like, and then I'll illustrate it and make a card. And it's a fun way to, like, generate a little bit more funding and then also do these, like, fun characters that I wouldn't normally get around to making because it's just a card and it's a really fun way to explore the world right. with a collaboration with the audience. And so these two different guys wanted me to make tree men. And so I ended up spending a lot of time figuring out what tree men look like in relic blade. Cause they, there weren't any previously. And then, uh, and then I was convinced that like, I definitely wanted to add tree men to, to relic blade. And so the race is called Arbolith and they are, more like more man than tree i would say yes they're, more, they're a yeah. humanoid that mm. is mm. tree-like in certain ways they've got like leaves for beards which is just too fun and they've got mushrooms <laughs> that like hardwood mushrooms that grow on them for armor but for the most part they're like a you know eight to ten foot tall humanoid that would exist in the world of Relic Blade and, and realistically uh, wouldn't necessarily fit in with most civilized towns. But man, oh man, how cool would that be? I, I just like always imagine what these characters like walking through the markets and uh, <laughs> you know, like these like in the shadows, there's a dark wanderer there, uh, probably smoking a hookah or something. And there's hmm. like music and the Iguan are like working hard and, and calling out the catch of the day. And I, I just imagine <laughs> like dense, like weird creatures that exist in, in the relic blade universe, all meeting in these like frontier towns where that's where you buy your gear and everything. And the, the governess there is sort of shady. And so good guys and bad guys intermingle. That's what I imagine. So this big tree man walking through, he wouldn't be totally out of place because everything's so bizarre, but He's not like tree beard walking through a marketplace where there's like this 200 foot tall ancient creature. It's more like right. a race. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on the plus side as well, he, uh, he does have knees as well. He does. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I'd like to see my test. some detail work with his claw hands. Though. I, you know, I, I, I kind of like how they look. Well, I hope so. They're supposed to look cool. But yeah. I mean, he'll have a hard time picking his nose. Actually, maybe picking his nose will be the easiest thing. He'll have a hard time eating a burrito. He'll have a hard time eating a burrito. But, you know, he doesn't really have to pick his nose. He just plucks a leaf out and, you know, it cleans it out. He probably has, like, little birds that crawl around and pick his nose for him. There you go. You See, know. That's a stretch goal right there. It's just yeah, like, little, little, <laughs> little birds that sit all over it. Uh-huh. I now need I now need two of these. One will be like that, and the other one I'm just gonna put bird's nests on. Yeah, <laughs> and then one that I could throw a bandana and sunglasses on it with green stuff. Oh yeah! <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah, and you gotta just paint him paint him with like the neon colors. Oh yeah, completely. <laughs> oh man. Uh. Oh yeah. Already... So then the, the third thing. So I'm also making a uh, campaign book. Yes. And, uh, and so the campaign book is going to have six missions. It's going to have in print some of the missions that already are from the faction sets. So you know how there was little pamphlets. So now they'll be yeah. collected in a book. There's okay, also so. a mini campaign, um, and then a bunch of lore and setting for the Volgic region. Uh, which is where Riverhold is, and that's the name of the river that the main city that the campaign takes place in. There's new environments and new treasures and new monsters and all that stuff. So it's a really, really great uh, supplement that's going to add like a lot more opportunities to play. And then also a bunch of cool art and lore to expose more of that side of Relic Blade, because so much of it has been visual at this point, you know, you have the models, you have the cards that are all illustrated, um, but you don't necessarily know all the history and everything. And so I've got a good chunk of, of uh, lore to, to play at and enjoy. 
Yeah, and it, it'll be it would be good to have you, you know, nail it down because you know it, it's it's been three years now, and sometimes uh, you know I've found that you know the stories have changed, mm. <laughs> which I mean you know is great because they only get better, but uh, you know, kind of kind of having some of the you know or a bunch of the lore down, yeah, will be will be a whole lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. And you kind of approach it from the different faction standpoint. So you get to like um understand the world from from what they're after and what their the sinister sinister designs of the Dark Wanderers and things like that. So it's kind of fun. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned, you know, the iguans calling out the catch of the day and all I could think of is the wretched hive and the slavers, you know, so the catch of the day is who they caught for slaves. It might be a lot of them. I think I imagine iguan aren't, they aren't all criminals. Right. But I think a lot of them are sailors and laborers and fishermen and that type of like, like hard, hard, they're all like honest, either honest, hardworking people or extremely dishonest, hardworking people. <laughs> either way, they have, they, they pulled themselves up by their lizard like bootstraps, yeah. by their tails, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Assuming they still have their tails, right? Yes, right. Yes. Actually, so is it, is it the poacher? Yep. Yeah. So the poacher doesn't have his tail. But when I was putting him together and I had I had gotten my stuff at Adepticon, so I took a bunch of it out of the package. I was putting stuff together. Yeah, um, well, I get home and I, I'm going through and I'm putting whatever I didn't have already put together together. And I get to the poacher and, you know, I, all of a sudden I notice he doesn't have a tail. And I'm searching everywhere. Like, where did his tail go? I lost his tail. <laughs> I'm searching high and low, tearing apart my bags. You're, I'm sure you're not the only one to do that. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I think I think I saw, you know, as everything was shipping out, somebody went, um, did you not ship his tail? Or I think I lost it or something like that. I'm like, no, 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 buddy. He just doesn't have one. <laughs> he ditched it. <laughs> He probably ate it. I mean, you know, sometimes, sometimes you get hungry. Yeah, or someone else got hungry, or some, you know, that basculus looks a little fat, and maybe he oh. ate his tail. For sure, that basculus is evil. Yeah, he is. I hate that stupid guy. He's so <laughs> great, man. He'll just hold the center of the table and cause problems all day. Oh, oh yes. No, I so you were talking about, you know, there's there's some some experience needed with, you know, the rules and all that to play. I was doing demos and there was people that wanted to play, you know, the the lizard folks, you know, just all the time and they just didn't matter if they had just barely walked by and looked at it. They'd get playing those lizards and just be whooping up on me. Oh yeah. Because, uh, because Within just a couple minutes, they look and they go, okay, he can paralyze, he can paralyze, he can just stab them really hard. You know, they're like, I, I see how this plays. Yeah, it takes it takes a certain gamer mind, um, which isn't necessarily everyone's cup of tea, which, I mean, it's, it's fine with me. I, I mean, there's a reason I haven't made control wizards or, um, or other, you know, because, like, as a game designer... I'm also a, a, a game player, and yeah. so then often I, when I play D and I'm always a guy with a sword, just swinging his sword like crazy, and and not really, not really using all of the skills available on the table. And so even something like a rogue is kind of a stretch for me. And then you want me to put, design spellcasters? My goodness! So I'm I'm really <laughs> careful when I do it, and I like methodical and take it take inspiration from other games and other people's experiences and try and write something good. Um, which which but is that good. doesn't mean that I'm necessarily good at playing all of the models that I play. Cause I'd rather just run in and swing a sword around. <laughs> and every time we've played that, that's basically how you've designed your force. Yeah. <laughs> Very straightforward. I am coming to smash you. Yeah. So really, it's it, it's not really characters. It's it's a sword. It's an animate sword that's being you know 
held by, <laughs> back by this meat wagon that just happened yep, when I played D and D. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, yeah. Next time, I'm just gonna be a cursed sword, and then <laughs> and then. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, the like fighter attached to it is actually like just dead guy. It's like it's like weekend at Bernie's. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's <laughs> my character is a cursed sword, and then I've got like this weird peasant boy. That <laughs> is my. <laughs> so I've been reading the Eisenhower Eisenhorn series of books lately, <laughs> and and in there he um he fashions uh, Barbara Sater, which is a a sword. That kind of has its own spirit, so it kind of does things on its own as he uses it. Mm-hmm. I'm <laughs> so, sorry, That's right? But you know, then there's other books uh, to include um, Brandon Sanderson's like Cosmere, which has a sword in there that's that you know says says you know, do you want to kill evil today? And has no actual concept of what's good or evil. Just if it makes you angry, it must be evil, and let's kill it. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love sentient magic items. I think they're great. Hello, Stormbringer, Elric. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's just, there's tons of things out there. So I could totally see that. That would be, that would be amazing. I think you need to design one of the relics that it's a sentient sword and it does take over, or, or a sentient something weapon. Yeah. And it totally takes over. It becomes a character. It has a model, and it has a person carrying it. But it can be Bill, the Billman's buddy Steve, that yeah. gets handed this. And, and it Steve, can never die because if someone picks it up, then it it continues its quest. Exactly. Um, hell, even in the uh, in the, even in the original uh, Baldur's Gate games, there was this one sword, or was it the second one? One of them, uh, there was this sword that if you didn't kill something within a certain amount of time, it would start taking life from you until you did go kill something. Yeah, I can see that as a weapon or just even (laughs) as a character where it's like just the sword itself or whatever the weapon is, is just a character. And like you literally have like this half dead fighter, like hanging on for dear life, got like an arrow in the knee just because, you know, (laughs) it's all wounded. (laughs) <laughs> but the sword just keeps him going <laughs> but the sword sustains him let's go That'd kill more stuff <laughs> yeah so Can I take a day off no <laughs> so we've talked a lot about it but uh how many so you've got the campaign book it's going to be touching upon like a lot of the the, the stuff that you've had written for relic blade and now you're like fleshing out the world and really giving it its own character uh-huh. in a lot of ways when can we expect the Kickstarter to go live? Because we haven't actually said oh, yeah, that yet. It's going up November 23rd. So that's the day after Thanksgiving. So, oh, I guess Black Friday. Is that a good idea to launch it on Black Friday? Nothing matters. Nothing uh, matters. No, everything is relative. There's no yeah. perfect day to launch a Kickstarter. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, yeah, so Black yeah. Friday. Meet me on Kickstarter um, and pledge some money for some red miniatures and a cool book. Um, yeah, it, it should be super fun. I, you know, I'm an artist all the time and leading up to Kickstarters, I'm always like really stressed trying to figure out, how, am I really going to do this again? It's so hard, but then uh, I'm, I've got all this great stuff that I'm already made and I want to produce and I've got fans that like it and it's just so much work. And so then when I set a, a, a deadline for myself, like, okay, we're launching the Kickstarter on this date. Then I like get into high gear and my like creative iffiness turns into like real creative drive. And so I know myself and I'm really excited to have announced the date and be ready to put the finishing touches on like one more model to have everything basically ready. So I'm really excited. That's, that's awesome. Because I know I'm looking forward to it. Um, I guess uh, one of the questions is, are you going to be offering the Legends this time around? Or are you going to keep up with the theme of every other one? Uh, All right. So I think that I will. um, But I'll only do one. Last time I did two. And that was too many. That was too many illustrations to do in such a short amount of time. But I'd like to do one. And then I was also toying with the idea of 
encouraging people to write bad guys because almost all the legends are good guys. So maybe it doesn't really matter because legends aren't really like the core game. They're more of like a fun add on, but, um, but it might be fun to like encourage people to think of monsters or dark Lords or creatures that are um, from campaigns they played that they really liked. So I might encourage people to do that, but that's the only iffy thing. It'll be legends or will it be legends evil? That's it. But yeah, so definitely if you want to, get one of those slots. If you missed some last time or you thought of something since the last Kickstarter, um, definitely be ready to jump in and get one of those. Cause they're only going to be 10 slots and that's it this time. Well, I know, uh, I know Baron while hobby- hobbying, mm-hmm. he's, uh, he's probably going to have one because I think he's had one in all of them so far. Yeah, I think uh, so. <laughs> he's, he's got a lot, a lot of ones to think of, but, um, you know, I know, I know I've wanted to do it, um, and I'm I'm pretty sure I am I am doing it this time. And even though I've never really used the legends, I like showing it off to people. You know, going look at all these cool things. Yeah. But also look at all these cool things that when when Sean sits down and talks to the fans, it slowly works its ways in. You know, gnomes, the iguan, mm-hmm. uh, the arboleth, um you know, just, just all these, you know, all these different ones out of there. And I know that, you know, we've talked about some of the other ones that are, our inspiration for, uh, you know, a path that you want to take eventually. Yeah, exactly. So it's, just, it's so fun for me too, because like uh, the collaborative reality of making a, a hobby game like this is that it the game isn't really done until you paint your models and play your games. And so, so it's, it's always a, collaboration between me and my audience mm-hmm. but with this like the actual world grows when when with my audience like seeing what the where the tree men are and what they're like or or so, sort of sort of early on exposing the iguan as a race and then also sort of engaging with the idea of abusive evil like it's one thing to be like destructive evil like the pigmen you know, that they're fun to battle and it's sort of like lighthearted battle against bad guys. But then with, with things like slavery, yeah. it's so dark. <laughs> that, oh, yes. That like suddenly you're like, this is like just abuse and like gross. And so I sort of was like, how does that exist and fit into the world of Relic Blade? And it's like, oh, obviously it exists because because uh, Sinvar is an escaped slave that now is an assassin. And so I'm like, oh, wow, all right, what are the lizard folk like? And slavery is obviously a big part of what they do, and I want them to be like a criminal underground. So, like, all of this is just born out of the conversation that I have with with um, my audience. And it's so, it's so cool. It's such a wonderful way to grow the game. Um, yeah, it's my favorite. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I, I'm happy to find out that you know now I've got number two, uh, you know, contribution to to the world, you know, with the brawler, you know, yeah, and, you know, and I'm I'm interested to see, you know, I explained the broad idea, and and it, you know, it's fun when talking with you, you know, especially in person because you're you're always like, I'm sending that to myself in an email, and you're yeah. whipping out your phone and typing it because. You're like, I will totally forget that otherwise. So, yeah. uh, you know, so you are, you, you know, you do, you know, pay attention to, you know, your fans, your friends, you know, everyone who, who provides something, you know, yeah. and, and talks about it and gets excited about, about the game. Um, and it, and it gets infectious. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do my best. Like a lot of people, I get, people sending me ideas on a pretty regular basis. And I really just like, I think about, I think about all the ideas and I try and think about like what, what I want and how it'll, how it'll practically apply and what the best way to, to implement those things. And some, some ideas like the gnomes just like get stuck in my head and I have to make them. (laughs) Uh, And then other ideas, it's like, yeah, that's cool, but maybe it's not perfect. And so I, I like have it on the back burner. And so I'm always like brewing this like stew of fantasy adventure in the back of my head. Oh yeah, and and one of those examples would be, 
wizards, you know, right, yeah. even, like, even from there need to be wizards. Right? <laughs> uh, obviously there needs to be, but you have, you've broached it. I know we've talked about it even here on the podcast on some of the, you know, previous times you've been here that wizards are something that you're looking at and they may be what's coming up or, you know, whatever, but you know, you, you decide to push it off and all that because like you said, you know, like you said earlier, you know, you just weren't ready. You didn't feel that they were going to be the proper representation on the board. Yeah. The idea wasn't done cooking. And, and that's, that's a great thing as well, because I mean, I think we can all say that there have been some, some IPs out there that when they release something that you've been dying to see, when you get it and you play it, you go, Oh, that wasn't done. Yeah. Wah, wah. Yeah. And, and, you know, so it's it's nice to see that, you know, I'm taking my time with this, but I've got this other thing that I thought of that here you go. Yeah, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't necessarily know you wanted them, but now yeah. there's a bunch of gnomes. <laughs> no, no, I knew I wanted the gnomes. <laughs> that was maybe, it, right? I'm, maybe I'm the only one that wasn't sold until I started. I was like, oh, my gosh, you're right. We do need gnomes. <laughs> yes, you you were pretty much the only one in the entire community that didn't know that gnomes were a necessity. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, how dare you? This- <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, because, because the gnomes are just so amazing, especially because you made them right. You made them just so teeny tiny. Yeah, and, I like them. and there is something so awesome about them. And actually, um, Epic Duck, my cousins, he's been he's been doing Inktober, and he uh, last month he was doing Sculpt Timber, and he was working on this mushroom guy, mm-hmm. and he was trying to figure out what to do with the top of the staff. He had this curl on on this mushroom wizard staff, and so he was trying different things, and we we're throwing different stuff out, and then one day he just kind of doodled on a paper this little little mushroom sitting in the crook of the staff, and it was just so cute. And like all of his other pictures that, you know, he's been doing a bunch of, uh, he's calling them Myconians, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, he's doing all of these mushrooms and they almost all of them have these little itty bitty mushrooms. And, and we keep, I keep talking to him going, I need like three dozen of those, but it has to be like six to a 25 millimeter base mm-hmm. you know, right, yeah. <laughs> of these like teeny tiny little mushrooms because they just need to be like these crazy little little you know monsters running around yeah i'd love to make a really small creature but mm. all in good time it'll be fun i i i hope to add with the stretch goals i hope to add and explore some fun stuff but too soon yeah. really dedicate any of those to um the official nature of the <laughs> podcast that's going to go way out into the universe <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I I can understand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I look forward to seeing seeing what you have brewing in the back of your head for stretch goals, um, because the stretch goals are worth as much as just the the original goal. Yeah. You know, the, yeah, man. The last Kickstarter was a lot of stretch goals. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try and keep it under control because like. I don't know if I can handle the stress of designing like eight more characters suddenly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's some cool ones. I'm going to try and keep it, keep it sane and then also make it so that it's not too complicated to fulfill. Cause last time it was like, what of the like 30 optional add-ons did you want? And so then I had to go through the list and like pack each package and it was super crazy. So I'm going to try and maybe bunch them into groups. So it's like, do you want to add optional buy-in A or B and have them be like big clumps? I don't know. Try and figure it out. Logistics, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's definitely a lot of uh, logistics to that. Mm-hmm. Well, especially with you being a one man show, it's not like you just be like, Oh, I could do all the options. Cause yeah. you're going to drive yourself crazy. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, warehousing isn't in my in my wheelhouse, and like right now, my studio is just in a temporary spot. So, so all the more I'm sort of challenging, just like 
like be able to work each day and have it work out really well. So it's going really well, but, um, but there's always challenges. <laughs> it's just how it goes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I am sure you'll have it, uh, ha- have a great solution to it or yeah. at least one that works. Yeah. Yeah. I've, and I've had a couple of really productive days. I was getting super stressed out and that elf that I showed you guys earlier went from being like, nothing to being that and so that's always promising when i can sort of turn nothing into something i I remember that oh that's the magic of art you have ideas and then they become a thing yes and it it's great to see it i'm uh i'm glad it was able to be something and you were able to show it off today because that that is uh that is a great something yeah i like her Yep. Awesome. So we're so Black Friday. We will see yeah. the launch of this new Kickstarter. That's right. And it's only it's going to go for like two weeks, a little over two weeks. So like I think December tenth is when it's going to be done. So um, so if you want to get in on it, just get in on it right away. Because uh, long drawn out campaigns are not my style. No, yeah. to be honest with you, like because of the fact that you've already got the following and it's so clean and concise, doing more than that would actually do more harm than good. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. I no, I yeah, it's it's one of those things that, again, just from yep. seeing this stuff a lot within the industry with other companies, sometimes it's best just to go clear, concise, done. Mm-hmm. Just boom, yeah. boom, done. I think it's better that way too. I mean because once you're done with the fundraising campaign, then there's so much more work to do that the sooner you can actually get to doing that work, the faster you can fulfill it. So like we'll figure out what stretch goals I got to sculpt. And then I'm going to spend Christmas sculpting (laughs) (laughs) and try and get them ready so that I can have the new stuff at Adepticon. That's sort of the like hard deadline is let's make sure there's new stuff at Adepticon. Awesome. Makes perfect sense to me. Mm-hmm. For sure. And Definitely. then we can hang out in person while drink beers. Yes. Exactly. Which drink beers which is, and play games. Which is definitely one of the one of the you know most awesome things to do anyways. Um I actually you know just roll dice and drink beers, which is what you can do at Adepticon. So that that's the the um dovetail promo piece that I'll put together here on Skirmish Supremacy Podcast. This show brought to you by Sean wants you to go to Adepticon. Come and hang <laughs> out with me and buy Relic Blade and and throw dice and drink beer. It will be fun. I I am looking forward to it. Actually I've had a uh, I've had a few people reaching out going, Hey, I'm gonna be at Adepticon this year. You know, let's let's meet up and hang out. And drink beers because you and Tim are always talking about beer. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I, I'm definitely, definitely eager and excited to see it. Good. Well, see awesome. this stuff. See, see, you know, everyone that I know. Um, and I was, I was making my, uh, well, my pseudo plans for uh, next year and all that, and. You know, I, I may uh, I may try to sneak over for KublaCon again. Oh yeah, that'd be fun. That was yeah. fun. I I have that show booked. I did like prepaid it and everything. Sweet. Wow. So that's another shout out. If y'all want to come to San Francisco, it's a great group of guys. Lots of ga- good games going on at KublaCon. You know, that's a show that I have yet to check out. It's one of those. Even when I was at CMON, I never got a chance to go out to. It's funny because like. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, Nick can tell you, but like, it's the website made it look like it was a community <laughs> center, like podunk get together. But then it's like this massive, awesome game convention where, like, but and the highest priority there is to be playing, and so there's like tons of people just playing all hours of every day, and that's like the main priority. So. Um, unlike other shows where you kind of are there and maybe you'll buy stuff, and there's you're walking around the showroom floor and then there's some tournaments. It's like very low tournament, very low um, commercial, but super high on gaming. So it's 
a very cool show. Yeah, the vendor area did surprise me because it's so small. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, uh, just additionally, it just was so varied. But, you know, that that wasn't bad. But that was just in the one hotel. They're mm-hmm. in another hotel as well. Yeah. So, so the main hotel that we were in, just Kublai Khan takes it all over. And then there's a sister hotel, or I don't even know if it's actually a sister hotel, like in the same same company. It's just the next nearest one. Yeah. They they take over that one too. And the funny part is, is that like the first day, while it was still pretty low key, some of the people from that other hotel came over to visit and were getting a tour by the the hotel staff, you know, there, and they were talking about it and talking to some different people, and they're like we didn't expect it to be like this. And they're like, and there's a ton of people where we're at, you know, they're like, this thing's just huge. You know, like they were just looking around with this odd expression on their face because like Sean said, you know, just everywhere you went, like they have this great big, just in the, like the center of the hotel, like the rooms wrap around Mm -hmm. and in the center isn't like this big open area. Well, I mean, it is, but it's not like, you'll see fountains or anything like that. No, there's this big area that they have like a bar and a restaurant and all that, that that's all kind of interconnected. Well, when Kubla Khan rolls in, that just becomes all gaming. Yeah. All board games all day. And then all of the rooms turn into role playing. So there's just like tons of D&D and Pathfinder. And then all along the walls right there is all of these conference rooms and stuff like that. Or not even conference rooms, like the big rooms. You know, they they can be divided into like small conference rooms, but, Mm -hmm. you know, and they have D&D, they had Magic, they had Pathfinder, they had different board games, you know, just all these. And this was the second floor. They still had another floor below that that was all gaming. Oh, yeah, it's packed. And yeah, and so then there's also, there's historical war gaming and then there's other... Uh, more like fantasy war gaming stuff going on too. Um, yeah. And yeah, so it's really fun. And and like the big thing for me is that it's, it's like local. And so um, I got to meet some cool local dudes and they they were helping me with play testing. And, um, and so that's been really cool to get plugged in with like a, a group of rad dudes that are into war gaming. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of fruit that comes out of going to cool game conventions. So, so just sort of pumping up. If you're a if you're a a, a garage uh, a garage war game, we're listening to this podcast. You can come and check out some conventions, and you'll meet a bunch of other grognards ready to roll dice and <laughs> talk about heavy metal and. Um, <laughs> make weird jokes about war gaming. Yeah, that only other war gamers understand. Exactly. It's just so fun. It's so great to like connect with your people. <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh it's it is amazing. Um I, I don't even like crowds. And that was the thing, was that at like Kublacon and even Adepticon, there's a lot of people. I forget how many people I, there was three or 4,000 at Kublacon and something the same at Adepticon. Well, I forget how a little over five this last year. Yeah. You know, yet it didn't feel crowded, you know, like it wasn't at either show. It wasn't like you had to press through a load of bodies. Well, like I think the difference is the energy of people are at game conventions because they want to have fun and play games. And so everyone's a lot more relaxed. Whereas like when I've done shows like San Diego comic con, everyone there is like super stressed, trying to get in line, waiting in line, trying to like get signatures or exclusive my little ponies. And so it's like a different energy. No one's there to have fun and relax. Whereas at at Adepticon, everyone is there to like have fun and do the thing they like to do. So they aren't as stressed about it. Yeah. yeah. And and that's the big thing too. Like even from working conventions like Gen Con, Gen Con's the same way. It's like you look at it and go, are you people actually here to have fun? Because you look around, everybody's like, oh, they need the new next exclusive thing. And they're all standing in lines and you know, they're all getting cranky when they're not getting to where they need to be. And it's like, this is supposed to be a gaming convention, not like come here and get stressed for four days. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Which, yep. of course, then let's talk about it from the vendor side of things. Yeah. No, ah, I'll save that for another ah, show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like half a day and you're like, I want to burn it down. Yeah. But... <laughs> So I, but, I think uh, I'm anyway. going to call her, uh, you know, Captain Canada because those look awful li- a lot like maple leaves in her hair. Uh, you're looking at the uh, the elf. Yeah, she's got leaves in her hair. She's such a hippie. <laughs> uh, and so here's the thing. Here's the. Uh, uh, so it, she's a wild elf, and all of the wild elves I've sculpted so far. My intention was for them to have enormous hair, like just gigantic wild Merida hair, and. Uh, and like they all just look like regular hair because once you get down to the miniature at scale, like everything's just sort of super detailed and small. And so this one, I'm determined to have her have giant hair. So when <laughs> if you open your Kickstarter and you pull out the model and her hair looks normal, just note that I'm like cursing the sky. <laughs> I want it to be enormous. <laughs> I I wanted big hair. Well, Shaking a it... giant stick at the cloud people kind of thing. Yeah. If it ends up being small when uh, when I get it, uh, you can you can trust. I'll I'll green stuff it to make it bigger. Okay. Thank you. You know what you could do just to fix the issue overall is instead of her jumping off of that cloud of smoke, just have her jumping off of her own hair and just have oh, her, her wrap around. <laughs> now, yeah. So now, boom, done. Mm, that's what I needed. Well, actually, I I was thinking, you know, instead of that, she's got this. Uh, jacket or cloak that's kind of flowing off the back if that was just her hair (laughs) maybe that's more hair than i originally planned (laughs) i like your ideas i'll I'll put those in the back burner i I totally love when when we find out we've gone too far with sean when you know he's like no (laughs) please please stop talking You oh, make her man. totally out of hair. Just she could be a giant worm monster. <laughs> that would be the final <laughs> form of the, the wood elves or wild elves. Cousin it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah. So on that note, Sean, where could everybody find your products? Oh yeah. So relicblade.com and on the Facebook group Relic Blade Adventure Battle Friends. Those are probably the best places to keep track of us and uh, and find the miniatures in the game. It, there's six factions currently available. There will be two more factions in this next Kickstarter. There's a campaign book already out, and there will be new campaign book with tons of new content coming in the next Kickstarter. So you can jump in now, or you can wait and jump in with uh, other stuff in the Kickstarter. And uh, either way, a world of adventure awaits. Fantastic. Well, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode of the Skirmish Supremacy. We will see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme, because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at Tim at SkirmishSupremacy.com or Nick at SkirmishSupremacy.com. Thanks for listening.